and over and we'll spend a minute because the one example that we're going to look at today is going to have most of what we covered. Um, we went over static. We went over wrapper classes such as integer with a capital I. We went over casting and we started on the try catch. I don't know if we did anything else. That sounds about everything. Let's look at the example we went off of last time. Let's bring it up here. And this will have some of the things that we did last time and then it will have it'll it'll dovetail into our next topic which is exceptions. So All right. If we look at this, this is simply a little routine to written to intentionally get an exception. All right. If you look, notice how I have int i and then with a capital I I have integer. That is called a wrapper class. And the reason for it is remember that ints are primitives. Integers are sort of an object version of int. Why do you need that? Well, certain things require an object reference. They won't work with primitives. For example, adding to an array list. We cannot add a primitive to an array list. We have to add an object reference. So, I could not say I have a, an array list called C I could not simply say c dot add i because i is an int. All right. However, i i is an integer, so I can add that. Now, one of the concepts we talked about was uh, related to these wrapper classes is boxing and unboxing. Boxing and unboxing relates to the ability to sort of treat an integer like it's an int. So I can say i i equals i, and it does the work for you. You don't have to do any sort of conversion or call any methods. You essentially can treat it like uh, a primitive. And so I could use it in an expression. I could say, you know, x equals i i plus 3 times 22. All right, and it would work just as though it was an integer, or an int rather. Um, so that's what boxing and unboxing is. The only time you really get in trouble is if you do comparisons. And that relates to the manner in which objects are compared. So if you're comparing an int and an integer, if my memory serves, you're okay. It's only when you compare an integer to an integer, given that they're both object references, that you run into trouble because remember, when you compare object references, we have that problem that we ran into um, with the pizza example, you're actually comparing to see if it's the exact same object. So you'd want to use the equals if you're comparing two integers. All right. So static, we you don't see an example of this. Well, I guess you kind of do. You see public static void. A static method or a um, a static method is a method that does not require an instance of an object to use. So, it's, you know, you, you oftentimes use it for constant. example I gave is, is for circles, you might put pi in a static method to return to get pi because pi doesn't depend on the specific circle you're talking about. Pi is simply pi. Now, in this case, in later versions of Java, you can declare an array list as containing a certain kind of object. We did that with, well, we did that with a lot of things. We did that with pizzas, for example. But here, I'm just declaring a plain old array list, which means I can put anything I want to into it. So this is an array list. I can put any kind of object into it. So, first thing I do is I add ii to my array list. Then I loop through the array list and I cast that object to an integer. This is like 
And I know you weren't here on Monday, but this is like we do in Android, where we say um, button B equals button get view by ID R dot ID dot button ID. All right? You're telling it, when you cast it, you're telling it, I know that this is a member of this class. So compiler, even though I could put anything in that array list, I know that I'm putting integers in there. All right? Therefore, I can treat that entry like an integer. And, in fact, if it is an integer, everything's okay. And it works. So let's go and run this without getting any errors. Because the only thing I've added to it is uh, one single integer object. So, let me go in here. And let me go to the desktop and in that directory. All right. It's warning me I'm doing something dangerous, and we'll talk about that in a second. But notice it is only warning me that it did actually compile it. So if I go and execute it, it comes up and it says that my number squared is 9. So I put 3 in there, I squared it, and I get 9. So everything's okay. The warning was due to this. This is what it terms as an unsafe operation. Why is this an unsafe operation? It's an unsafe operation because this array list can hold any kind of object. And we're telling Java to treat this object, each object in turn on the array list, we're telling to treat it like an integer. All right? Well, is warning us. That's unsafe. It'll work if you're sure that everything's an integer, but the minute you start putting other stuff in there, you're going to get an error because you lied to the compiler. You said, hey, I know this is an integer um, when it's not. So if we put a string or put a null in here, and I go and compile it, Again, it warns me that there are unsafe operations. I compile it with that dash L-I-N-T to see the details of it. Let's do that just to demonstrate. And sure enough, it tells me something to the effect that I'm not defining a specific class for the array list. I guess that's all the warnings relates to that. And I'm not doing any kind of checking on the argument. Okay. So I compiled it. Now I run it. And now it's going to try to take the word high and square it, which of course is not going to work. And sure enough, we get an exception. All right? This is a runtime error, and runtime errors are bad because they're situational. All right? You, you never, you know, is in this case we know exactly what caused it, but in the case of Larger applications, runtime errors usually are triggered by some certain combination of conditions. All right? And it's not always easy to recreate. You know, that's when I worked as a software developer. We tried to get, when someone called in talking about a bug in our program, we tried to get as much information as possible as what they were doing, what they put in, and so on. 
because that would help us recreate it. Because it's very difficult to um, fix an error if you can't recreate it. All right? And that's why, and again, users, programmers suck, make fun users, but I fair. All right? Because that's not the user's job. All right, to, to know programming inside and out and to think in technical terms. Users have other things in their mind. They're, they're doing other kinds of work. And therefore, they might not have as much detail as you want to as far as an error goes. But if a user can provide the detail, that's great. So if you're working with users, you know, you can sort of nudge them on the path by, you know, what were you doing when you got this error? You know, what were the input values and so on and so forth. All right. So what happens? It's a runtime error. It blows up. Stops working. It did the first one, right? But it blew up on the second one when it tried to square high. Because high, you can't convert that to an integer. You can't treat the letters HI, the string, as an integer. OK. So that's not good, <laughs> all right? answer to this would be if we really wanted to limit the kind of object that we put in that array list, we could uh, declare the array list with a type. All right? So that's one thing that we should do. And that would get rid of the warning. All right? And then it would give us a compile error if we tried to add a string to it. But that's what we're talking about today. The, remember, this was just engineered to give us an exception. So now that we have an exception, we want to do something to deal with that exception. So, I have another version of this. This is example one out on Canvas. This one is actually example three, where I've written some exception processing for this. So, an exception processing is accomplished with a try-catch block. And in this case, my try-catch block goes the try block is here. Then I have Now, you can put a try around any operation that could fail. Yes? Not that I know of, no. I mean, uh, it's possible that they slip something in, but. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this out. I'm actually going to comment this out. All right. To make for a simpler version of the try catch. So you put a try around a risky operation. All right. And an operation that's prone to fail. Now, what kind of operations are prone to fail? Definitely, if you're not real careful, a casting operation is prone to fail, right? Because you may think that it's guaranteed that this object is of a particular type, but if somehow another object gets in there, it's going to blow up. Accessing an external resource that is a database or doing file I.O., all those things are sort of outside of your hands as a developer, right? If I'm writing to a file and the disk is full, right, none I can do in my code to handle that. I can try it, and if it blows up, I can handle it gracefully, all right? Or if I try to connect to a database and there's a problem, the credentials are wrong or, or the database is down or whatever, I, none I can do in my program to fix that or to prevent it from happening, but I can handle it gracefully. So, 
when we have a try block, those statements are attempted. All right? If there is an error, that is called an exception is thrown. All right? You then need something to catch that exception. And in this case, I'm catching exception E. What that means is, if there is an exception, if there is a problem, the details of the problem is going to be put in an object called E. What kind of object is it? It's an exception object. And therefore, there's a lot of information that we can get. All right? Keep in mind that behind the scenes, we may write a detailed error message to a log somewhere. All right? So that we could go back and debug it. We might give a user-friendly error message to the user. So we might put up on the screen, hey, something went wrong, you know, email IT for questions or something like that. But we may log the more detailed error. So in this case, if I go and try to do a, a square, all right, if I go and run this, if I try to square a string, that's going to throw an exception. And in this case, I'm not looking for different kinds of exceptions. I'm simply saying any exception you encounter, do this. So let's see what happens now. No, it's whatever name you whatever name you give it. Yeah, I mean typically that's what people do, but it's not a requirement. All right. Still warning me about that. But if I go ahead and run it anyhow, I handle the air in a different way. So it might not be obvious the difference between this, because that, that air was um, you know, at the end. But if I had a bunch of items in my array list, when the system got the exception, it simply blew up and stopped processing it. All right? When I'm handling the exception, I can tell it what to do, and the loop can continue, and it can go and process other stuff. So if there's a problem for one thing, it won't necessarily stop everything else from working. So I went and added a few more instances of my integer to the list, and gave me the first square, gave me the exception. Now notice that's a message I displayed. All right? That's not a system message. All right? If I go back to the original one, and I put this in here a few times, Remember, this is running it without any exception catching. So the first exception that the system gets, it displays that error message and it stops. So if we had a million orders to process, for example, and we had, an, we had a problem with order two, 
is not going to process any of the rest of the orders. Whereas by putting in exception catching, I can decide what to do. And in this case, I display a message. I could log it to a file if I wanted to. Whatever, however I chose to handle it, I could handle it. But once that I've handled it, the system doesn't need to handle it. And the program can continue. So typically you write, re, uh, you write exceptions for stuff that if it blows up, you can do something with it. You can handle it and continue. So, in this case, pretending that this was processing orders, all the orders but the one would be processed. And then I could look at some exception report and see what was wrong, why that one blew up, and, and fix it. So again, exceptions happen when you attempt to do something that's illegal. And the example we saw is trying to cast something that wasn't an integer to being an integer. All right? Can't do that. Therefore, it blows up. Now, the question is, is are we going to handle it or are we going to let the system handle it? The system has one way of handling exceptions, blowing up and stopping the program and giving you an error message that looks like this. All right. We have other ways of handling exceptions. All right. We can display a more understandable message to the user and we can continue processing and skip that one for now. All right. And simply display it on a report. So if we handle it, we get to choose how we handle it. If we let the system handle it, the Java virtual machine handle it, it's going to handle it one way, crashing, stopping right there and give us that error message. Now, Close this for now. Now, what am I printing out for this? I'm printing out a phrase, the exception has occurred, and I'm concatenate onto that e.get message. What's e again? It's an exception object. Think of this as the error report that the Java virtual machine fills out for you. All right, so if an exception is thrown, information about that exception gets put into that object called E. What are the attributes that exist on it? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Sometimes I feel like I'm doing an infomercial up here. But wait, there's more. Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, what what else could we print out? What 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 lives in an exception object? Let's see. Probably well, we hadn't changed since then, huh?
Okay, two methods are get message and print, print stack trace. So let's go. I'm using the get message method here. Now, in this case, I don't even have to put anything from the exception to the user, right? I might say, because I kind of have inside information about what probably went wrong with this, right? If I'm looking at this code, this is not likely to be a problem. This is not likely to be a problem. This is likely to be a problem if it's the wrong type of data. So I could display to the user data in array list wrong type. All right. I could then Maybe, and again, I'm going to display I'm going to just display the stack trace, but I could send this to a different output. I could send this to a file. All right, so let's try compiling this. Would just be e print stack trace. Now, notice what I have here. First of all, notice it went through the whole array list, so it didn't blow up. I get the first is a user-friendly error message that I could send to the user. Data in array list is the wrong type. Assuming they knew what that meant, all right? But in this case, let's, let's pretend that they did. But notice what I get. I get a more detailed description here. It tells me what line of code it is. It tells me the specific kind of exception that was thrown. And this can be more useful if you're debugging it. So again, I can get a different error message for debugging purposes than I can to present to the user. So if I was doing an application, it would be reasonable to create an error log, you know, have an error object or something that created an error log that sent the output to a file. And if I ran the if someone ran my application and they got an error, Rather than intimidating them with a big, ugly error message like this, all right, I could check the exception file. Or I could ask them, hey, email me the exception file and, and go and see the results that way. So we can see different kinds of information. That exception object is like, it's like the accident report. You know, if you get into a fender bender, the cop comes, the cop gets all the properties, all the details of the accident, you know the street that you were on, this person was driving, that person was driving, a diagram, and so forth. Same idea here. When a problem occurs and an exception is thrown, that exception object has the details of the exception. All right? Yes? It depends on, it, again, it would depend totally on the context of this. Like, I would think if there was a problem, you would want to notify the user. Otherwise, the user thinks everything went, went okay, right? So what I'm saying, though, is you might want to express the fact that there's a problem in a different way to the user than what you need to debug. So you might put a very generic message, you know, 
problem happened, you know, whatever, something that would uh, a user would understand on their terms. But you might want to log the more detailed error message somewhere else. All right, or you could, you know, if you're thinking in terms of a GUI, you know, how many of us have seen this before? If you've used Windows. A little alert box that comes up that says problem, blah, blah, details. And you hit the details and you get something incomprehensible underneath it. All right. Well, again, if you were working with the developer on that, you know, if you just threw up that big giant detail error message, user's not going to be able to make any sense of it, all right? Whereas if I put a user-friendly error message here and then give the ability to click on that and see the details, then if they're talking with the developer about like, gee, what went wrong? Can you click the details button and tell me what it says? Or can you copy and paste that and email it to me? Then you, you could get the information you need to debug. All right, now, now that we broke it one way, I'm going to try to break it a second way. All right. Finally, I'm, I'm able to make mistakes. So I put a string in there. I'm going to put a null in there. Ooh. Yeah, I'm, I'm still typing, so thanks for letting me know, though. You know, Class, you know, classes must have started to like me more because in past semesters, other classes would let me go for a long time without telling me that. I think they just kind of got a kick out of seeing me. All right, so I put a different kind of error in here, a null object. All right, what's a null object? Well, it's an object reference that points to nowhere. All right, so you can't square nothing. You can't convert nothing into an integer. So... I'm thinking that's going to blow up too. So if I go and compile this, to save it. Interesting, it's given me both errors, but well, well we're gonna fix this in a second. I'm not really oh I'm duh. I'm not I'm reading this wrong. All right. I I thought it started here. I it starts up here. So it is giving us both errors. Here's the first error, when I tried to square a string. It says, hey, that's not allowed. All right. Here, it tells me, hey, you can't square whatever a null object. So it's giving me different kinds of errors. And notice it's giving me a different kind of exception. All right. Exceptions themselves are an inheritance hierarchy. 
All right? And we can find a little bit about what happened by simply looking at the type of exception. All right? Simply by looking at the type of exception. So let's get rid of the stack trace. The line number of the code. Well, the cast blew up here. That's what blew up for the, sper for the string. All right? You can't take a string and make it into an integer. The null object, it actually casted it as an integer. It's an integer null object. The problem comes when you go and try to square the integer. So that's where that one blew up. So subtle difference in the errors. All right? Both of them errors, but OK. I'm going to go and I'm going to write an error message here. And I'm just going to say error occurred. All right. Pretty bare bones error reporting. All right. So now, two different errors occurred for two different reasons. And yet our error message says the same thing. All right? Well, that's probably not good. It would be nice if we could tell the user, if we could display a more meaningful error message, that is, differentiate between the kinds of errors that we were getting. So instead of simply saying error occurred, I could say, Object the wrong type, or object is null. All right? So, how are we going to do that? Well, we can do that by We can do that by catching specific exceptions. Okay? We can do that by catching specific exceptions. If we noticed, when we did the stack trace, the one exception was a class cast exception. That string into an integer. The other error was a reference. Very, that's way up on the top of the charts in the Java exception top 40 every year. All right, that's, that's number one or two, right? So it goes in a hierarchy. I can say, if it's this kind of exception, do this. If this doesn't handle it, then this can catch all the other kinds of exceptions. So it's like a hierarchy. These exceptions are, again, just like any other class, there are subclasses. And at the top of the line, well, not at the top, because there's even some ancestors here, but we have our exception object inherited from that is a null object exception. from this is a class cast exception. So if you're handling exceptions, you can go from the most specific to the least specific. So I can say, hmm, I know that this could fail if that's not an integer. Therefore, I'm, gonna, I'm on the lookout for the class cast exception, all right, because that's liable to happen. So if a class cast exception appears, I display that error message. If an exception occurs that's not a class 
cast exception. Then it goes and it does and catches this exception, just the generic exception. That's a build into the Java is a class cast exception, right? And it's a subclass of exception. So let's go and save this and compile it. All right, notice what we get. We get. And let me go and add some of the extra values in here. Let's put a few before and a few after. All right, notice what I get. First of all, that finally clause happens every time at the end of the try-catch block. All right, I'm going to get rid of that. I just wanted to show that briefly, but let's get rid of that because that gets in the way. Every time, yeah, regardless, regardless if there's an exception or not, right. All right, notice I get two different messages. Why do I get two different messages? Because if I get this kind of exception, I can write a message specific to that kind of exception. So I know that the problem in this case is a casting problem. So I can write a user-friendly message saying, hey, this is the, this is the problem. All right. So in this case, maybe to write a more meaningful error message, I can say um, invalid data type. So now it tells me invalid data type. So I know actually what caused that, right? In this case, not a very terribly meaningful exception because this is the generic exception, all right? So any other error that occurs, this is the code that's going to run. And therefore, I can't be too specific about the kind of error that occurred. In this case, it displays null, but I don't know the type of exception. Now, how could I make a separate error message for null object reference? Pardon me? Exactly. So I could create let's let's see. Let's let's get this first and then we'll try that.
invalid data type, null object. So I can give a specific error message if I catch a specific exception. Now, when is this going to get called? It's going to get called when there's an exception that is not either a class cast exception or a null pointer exception. So yeah, some other one, yeah, integer out of range or whatever, um, it would give me uh, that exception. And this would be the generic one, so I could put some sort of generic error message. Now, you ask the question, do I have to catch, do I have to have that fail safe? Right, because that'll catch any exception that's thrown. So we're not going to let any exception by. Do we have to do that, though? And the answer is, nope, it doesn't care. All right? But what would happen, let's do this. Let's take both of these out of there. All right? Is it going to compile clean? Actually, it will, All right? Only under some circumstances does a compiler have the foresight to know what exceptions are possible. So that compiles cleanly. What do you think is going to happen, though, with that null object? It's going to blow up, right? It's going to revert back to us having no try catch at all, right? Because remember, someone has to handle the exception. It's either you or the Java virtual machine. The Java virtual machine handles the exception one way, blowing up and stopping the program. You can write code to handle the exception however you want to. All right? So in this case, I'm popping up an error message saying it's an invalid type. And I'm continuing, all right? But in the case of the null object one, when I run that, it blew up. And I don't continue on. It's as though it's an uncaught exception. I didn't handle that kind of exception, so it doesn't know what to do. Now, you might wonder how I can compile, even though I didn't catch some exceptions which are potentially throwable, all right? The idea is this. You write the exception processing for the code, for the exceptions that you want to do something if it happens. For some situations, you may want to let it blow up, all right? Blowing up might be the reasonable situation, some unknown exception that you hadn't anticipated. Like, who knows, there could be some ex other exception that could be thrown here that I just didn't know about. All right? We may want that to blow up. All right? So you handle the exceptions that you want to handle and that you can do something with and that makes sense given the context of what you're doing. If there's nothing you can do and you don't, you're not anticipating it, well, you could handle it and just display a generic error or your strategy might be to just let it blow up because if it's that kind of problem, Hey, I don't want it to do anything else. All right? Again, it's all context dependent. But remember, when the day is done, you handle the exception or you let the Java virtual machine handle it. Its way of handling it is crashing. Your way of handling it is however you choose to handle it. All right? Now, these are all sort of the built-in exceptions. Um, we've had a problem since like the first pizza class, like what happens if you set a pizza size to gigantic, for example, all right? It, it would, the way that we have our, our, our uh, code written in that pizza example, it wouldn't care. There's nothing in there that checked to see that it was one of those three values, small, medium, and large. All right, and therefore it would let me set that value, 
and it would um, let me go and calculate it, but it's probably going to return a price of zero dollars. You know, try it if, if you don't believe me. All right. Now, clearly that's not right. One of the reasons we said that we want to put our attributes in methods and not let them allowed to be um, addressed from outside of the class is because we want to put validation in there to make sure, for example, that when you enter a pizza and you enter the size of a pizza, you only give it one of those three values, small, medium, or large. Well, how can you handle that? Well, you can throw an exception. All right. Now, the makers of the Java framework handled a lot of different situations, but they did not handle a pizza is the wrong size exception. So guess what? You can write your own exceptions to say, this exception is a pizza wrong size exception. And I can then have my code throw an exception so that if you try to create a pizza, that isn't one of these sizes, it complains about it. And it complains about it through the mechanism of throwing an exception. Then anyone who uses your class is either going to have to handle that exception, all right, or let the Java Virtual Machine handle it, i.e. blow up if that happens. All right, that's what we'll look at next time. We'll look at creating our own exceptions for situations, for error conditions within our application. All right, so that's what the other example is out there. Yes? That, that's a good question. All right, that's a good question. The question was, we're, and we're writing these test classes where we're manually going in and setting things. Typically, I'm hooked to a UI, and we could put a drop radio buttons that force the user to pick small, medium, or large. They couldn't put in gigantic or anything else. The question is, does that get rid of the need to validate. What do you think the answer is to that? No. Why not? You are change. I have create a different mechanism for ordering pizzas. All right? I for example have an online system. I could have a Android app that ordered pizzas. I could have an iPhone app that ordered pizzas. I could what with Domino's now, you can text a pizza emoji to Domino's and they'll send you a pizza. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, you, you must define what your usual order is. I think. I would think. They, yeah, they, in, in the case of Domino's, yeah, you must define that. The point is, as was mentioned, the UI change and more there's going to be multiple, there could be multiple ways to consume your object, to use your object, all right, to use your class. And do I want to ensure that every single method that could possibly use my object gets that right? Or do I want to put the fail safe in my, cl my class is airtight? And it doesn't matter if someone writes a new user interface or whatever, that you can't possibly slip past the pizza class a size of gigantic. All right? So again, remember, there's object that are created, classes that are created, and then there are classes that consume those classes, that use those classes. All right? If you put the, the verification inside the class, then you don't ever have to worry about getting it right anywhere else. Yeah, I could make a UI that had 
only three options, small, medium, and large. But I'm still going to have the validation in there because I don't know some jokers liable to come around and mess up my beautiful UI that I designed, right, and screw it up or make a new UI or call it from a different application or whatever. It's kind of like wearing suspenders and a belt, right? It makes sure, yeah, and in one respect it's redundant, but in another respect, consider that to be a business rule. My pizzeria only sells small, medium, and large. And business rules, as you know, ought to be separate from the UI. All right? So I can cheat a little bit to make everyone's life a little bit easier and, and have a drop down that only has small, medium, and large. But I'm definitely still going to the, want the validation in the class. So you can't slip one past it. It's all the same concept, by the way, of... Uh, implementing referential integrity in a database, right? If you define a foreign key in a database, it doesn't matter what interface you use, you can't force bad data in, all right? Whereas if you leave that up to the interface, 29 interfaces might work, one might not, and all of a sudden you have um, not consistent, inconsistent, invalid data. All right? So yes. And that's an excellent question. And that's part of the skill of design is understanding that and understanding that that really falls under the category of a business rule. This is all our pizzeria sells, small, medium, and large. If you try to order something else, that's a problem. All right? So good question. All right. See you up in lab. All right. Yeah. That, that, that runs at the end of a try-catch every time, all right? So you could put some code in there. So like, look at it this way. There's some code that you run that may or may not work, all right? Regardless if it worked or not, there may be some code that you want to do to sort of finalize things, all right? So regardless of where it blew up, you might want to go back and, and wrap things up. No. Always happens, right. All right. See you up in lamb.